All right. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight for our Sip and Draw with David Sibley. My name is Michelle Hamner. I'm the Director of Development with Georgia Audubon. And we want to thank all of our members and friends for spending your evening with us. We have guests from all over the country joining us tonight, which is very exciting. Feel free to drop a hello in the chat box. Let us know where you're from and what you might be sipping on as we draw tonight. Myself, I've got a local brew from Creature Comforts in Athens, Georgia. Tonight's event is being presented as part of our annual Georgia Bird Fest, a month long series of field trips and workshops that actually wraps up this weekend. I want to give a special thank you to all of our BirdFest sponsors and patrons, especially as we had to reimagine many of our events this year due to COVID. I also want to give a huge thanks to Mr. Sibley's publishers for helping us put together the Sip and Draw event, which I understand is the first of its kind that they've organized. So we're real excited to be testing this format out with you guys tonight. I also want to give a special hello to all of the Georgia Audubon members on with us tonight. If you aren't a member of our flock yet, I hope you'll consider joining us. You can join or renew your membership at our website, georgiaaudubon.org. And before I turn things over, uh, just a few quick housekeeping notes. We are recording tonight's presentation and we'll send a link to the recording to all participants later this week. And we'll also be stopping for questions and comments several times during the presentation. Please put any questions in the Q&A box and we will do our best to get to them all tonight. Our guest tonight is so well known that he almost requires no introduction. David Sibley is a self-taught artist and has become one of America's best known field guide authors. In fact, his first bird guide, the Sibley Field Guide to Birds, was released in 2000 and is celebrating its 20th anniversary this month. His newest book, What It's Like to Be a Bird, takes us on a journey of discovery answering the most frequently asked questions about the birds we see most often. Geared as much to non-birders as it is to the out and out obsessed, the book explores more than 200 species and includes more than 330 new illustrations by Mr. Sibley. While its focus is on familiar backyard birds such as blue jays and chickadees, it also examines certain species that can be fairly easily observed if you're in the right spot, such as the seashore dwelling Atlantic Puffin. I highly recommend you pick up a copy. The artwork in it is just stunning. So with that, David, I will go ahead and turn things over to you. All right. Well, thank you, Michelle. Thanks to everybody for showing up. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so this is a it's a different kind of event for me it's the first time doing this sort of virtual drawing demonstration um, so i'm going to be <clears throat> sharing my ipad screen hopefully that will work and you'll be able to see what i'm drawing on on the ipad screen so a drawing will sort of magically appear without without a hand or a pencil or anything um, and uh, I'll, I'll pause and check for questions. Um, I'd like this to be sort of interactive and um, to explain things that you're wondering about as I go along and not just uh, talk at you. So, um, <clears throat> and I do want to say, I, I see in the chat a lot of people from, are from Georgia, no surprise. Um, I have the connections to Georgia. My wife got her master's degree at the University of Georgia in Athens, and we lived in Athens for a couple of years. Um, before that, she was studying wood storks um, near Millen, Georgia. Um, and I spent quite a bit of time there, um, and also Cumberland Island. Uh, so yes, I've been all over Georgia and really, really love it. Um, I had some great times there in the 80s. Um, and I wish I could be there in person right now, but <clears throat> we will do our best to uh, make the most of what we have. Um, so this, um, we're going to do a drawing, uh, a focus on drawing a hummingbird. Um, and I don't know how many of you watched, I did a video earlier this year um, for National Audubon about how to draw a hummingbird. Um, some of you might have seen that, and I'll do something similar here, but taking a lot more time to explain things as I go along. Um, <clears throat> and 
so let me get started. I'll share my screen and uh, All right, we're in. Um, so, um, with uh, drawing a bird, the simplest way to draw a bird is to start with uh, an, an oval for the body and a circle, more or less a circle for the head. Um, and the shapes of those ovals and circles change depending on the species that you're uh, that you're going to draw, and the, so you start to get an, uh, uh, the basic outline. So I'm going to start with um, this kind of diagonal oval for the body of our hummingbird. And uh, let me just make sure I'm on, yes. Um, and then, and you'll, with practice, you'll, uh, you'll figure this out, but the, the position of the head, um, you you uh, use this a circle, and for the hummingbird, I'm going to put the circle uh, not quite balanced over the body, a little bit, just slightly rolling off the side of the top of that oval, um, and smaller, obviously. Um, and this is just the, getting the beginning of the the outline. Um, the hummingbird's bill is long and thin, and I'll do that starting coming fr out from just above the center of the circle, not, not right in the center of the circle, but just above that. And I'm doing it angled up just a tiny bit and, and slightly curved, but straight is good enough. <laughs> um, there's lots of subtle, subtle little things as you're doing a drawing of a bird that um, the, um, the exact shape of the bill, slight curves, slight differences in the thickness, the taper, all, all those things make a difference. Um, and that all comes with practice and experience. So a long straight bill is just fine for a, a hummingbird. And then um, we'll block in the tail. The hummingbird's tail, um, so they move their tails around a lot when they fly, when they're hovering. Um, and so you can put the tail at almost any angle you like, but the, I'm going to put a little dot here. This is sort of the, the pivot point where the tail feathers are anchored. So you could have your tail raised up like this, coming from that dot and coming straight back. Or I'll back up. You can do the tail straight down from the body like that. Or vertical. And the tail really, it waves around. Some different species do different things. Different hummingbirds do uh, different movements with their tails, but let me back up. And I'm going to do the tail just slightly raised like this. Um, and I should say at this point I'm doing all fairly or light pencil lines, just, um, just uh, gently resting the pencil on the paper and doing these light lines just to get the shapes and and later we'll define those shapes a little bit more and and choose the the right lines um, so at this point uh, we have the basic shapes um, i'm going to go in and draw the start to define the the shape of the body a little bit more and birds are they're covered with feathers. All the feathers grow um, out from the body and curve back towards the tail. So everything's always curving back, smoothed back towards the tail. Um, and birds are very streamlined. The feathers make a really smooth, streamlined outline. So starting from the top of the base of the bill, uh, you want to curve up just a little bit to the top of the circle that you drew, and then to the back of the head, a fairly sharp angle down at the back of that circle, and then curving smoothly into the back. A fairly straight line down the back and straight into the tail. 
like that. And for the underside of the body, again, uh, coming from the underside at the base of the bill and tapering in and curving down, uh, down to the front of the body. There's a little angle at the chest, straight down the belly and another angle down here where the feet are. And again, tapering into the tail. And that's the, uh, the outline of the hummingbird's body. Again, everything's streamlined and smoothly uh, contoured. Um, the feathers do all of that so that as a bird moves forward through the air, it, it just slips through the air effortlessly. Um, the only time you'll see a bird with its feathers being ruffled is when it gets caught by a gust of wind coming from <laughs> coming from the tail, uh, uh, blowing uh, from the back of the body up towards the head. And they usually quickly turn around to face into the wind so that the wind uh, flows smoothly over their body. Um, David, are you able to tell us what program you're using? Uh, yeah, this is Photoshop on the iPad. And uh, uh, I'm using the iPad with the Apple Pencil. And it, this is just Photoshop. Um, so I'm using, you can see on the left, the brush tool. And down here on the lower left, I've got, uh, I can choose colors. So I'm using just a dark gray. And then I can choose the size of the brush I'm using and the, the opacity, the darkness of the line that it makes. Um, so I've chosen settings that are sort of like, uh, using a pencil. Um, let's see. Let me check the questions now and see what other. I don't see any questions. Oh, there's a Photoshop. Uh, I just got the iPad about a year ago and Photoshop has been the, the, it's the program, the app that I've used um, mostly because it's so, it's also so useful on the desktop, and the, the files transfer back and forth really easily. So I, um, this is all pretty new to me: the iPad and Photoshop, um, and uh, I have not used other other apps or devices. Uh, and I see the next question. Yes, this is going to be a ruby-threaded hummingbird, but at this point, um, you can't tell. <laughs> Hummingbirds all have very similar shapes, at least as far as I've gotten with this. So, um, uh, but yes, this I'm imagining this uh, would be a it will turn into a ruby threaded hummingbird. That's where I'm headed. And I see the next question: that do I like to draw on paper or on the device? I, you know, I. I am really, really enjoying drawing on the iPad this last year. Um, it's so, um, uh, what's the word? So, so powerful. Um, there's so much more you can do than what you can do on paper. The, the undo, <laughs> the, the backup, the ability to add a layer and work on something. And if it doesn't work out, just delete the layer and go back to where you were. Um, and so I'm, I've really, it's, it has actually opened up a whole new joy of drawing for me, I have to say. It's, uh, it's really fun um, and so much more uh, versatile and powerful than drawing on paper. Um, I still enjoy drawing on paper, but um, when I sit down to really spend some time drawing nowadays, I pick up the iPad. Um, and let me, uh, I see a, another quest, some more questions, some hummingbird facts. Yes, I will go back to working on the drawing and I will toss in some hummingbird facts. Um, and oops, my iPad just went to sleep. Wow. 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 
So um, let me go back to the drawing. Uh, um, so yeah, this hummingbird, the drawing I'm working on here is much larger than life. <laughs> I don't know how it appears on your screen, but hummingbirds, as most of you I'm sure know, are tiny, uh, three grams or three and a half grams, less than a, they weigh less than one nickel. Nickel's about five grams. Um, the ruby-throated hummingbird, like others, beat their wings more than 70 times per second, just about 70 times per second, and uh, just incredible. And I think one of the most fascinating things about hummingbirds is that they, um, they, a lot of their food is nectar, which they get from flowers, obviously. And there's a whole lot of this, this uh, complex relationship between hummingbirds and the flowers that they get the nectar from. The flowers want the hummingbirds to pollinate them. So they're, the flowers have developed with, um, so that they deposit pollen on the hummingbird's bill or forehead or throat. Um, different species of flowers, and then the hummingbirds carry that pollen to another flower and fertilize that plant. Um, and the flowers have a strategy. Most hummingbird flowers tend to be tubular red flowers and perennial flowers. They grow in the same spot year after year. And the hummingbirds remember those places, even if it's just a patch of flowers that they pass by on migration. They remember where that patch of flowers is, and they'll visit it repeatedly. Um, and they remember if they're in a big field with a lot of flowers around it, they remember which flowers they visited so that they, they do kind of a circuit and they visit each flower um, in turn after a certain period of time to allow the nectar supply to replenish. So they, they remember the locations of the flowers, they remember when their last visit was to that flower, they remember this from year to year so they can visit the same flowers again. And it's no wonder that a lot of you probably have hummingbird feeders and when you put out the hummingbird or when the hummingbirds come back in the spring, if you haven't put the hummingbird feeder up on its hook in your yard, the birds will come and hover at the spot where the feeder should be um, expecting to find it there. That's all, they are, they are hardwired to learn the locations of food sources and remember those. Oops, now I've lost my iPad again, there we go. Um, okay, back to drawing. <laughs> um, so I'll work on the hummingbird's eye. Now the position of the eye, and most birds, um, if you imagine a line coming straight back from the, along the line of the bill, right down the center of the bill and back into the head, the eye should be just above that line and just a little bit forward of the center of the head. And the eye is just a circle right there. And hummingbirds have a, um, they have a complex sort of a, um, structure or contours at the base of their bill. So a curve, uh, a shallow curve from the around the nostril from the top of the base of the bill back about halfway back to the eye and then curving down to the eye um, and then forms kind of a triangle in front of the eye that's going to be dark um, behind the eye there's a more or less a triangle of light color and then below the eye, a, um, uh, if you have a line curving around underneath the eye and then curving down and back towards the, a little bit back towards the back of the neck, uh, the hummingbird has kind of a dark mask in there. And then uh, a line curving back to the back of the neck. Um, now male hummingbirds have these incredibly um, brightly colored iridescent feathers on their throat 
called a gorget. And, uh, but it's really, it's the throat feathers there, but they're uh, highly modified, adapted to reflect certain colors of light and to amplify those colors of light. So the outline of that is just a curve coming forward from the, the bottom of that mask forward to the front of the throat. And on ruby-throated hummingbird, the, uh, the chin is black up here, and the rest of this is going to be just brilliant red. Um, but we'll uh, leave that for now. You can color that all later. Um, so I'm going to color the eye dark. And then um, let's do the wings next. So the wings are um, right around here. Um, on the upper part of the body is where the wings attach, sort of where the, it's the bird's shoulders. So, um, so do a, a very light um, oval there. And the wings on a hummingbird go back and forth very quickly. And the way that I draw that uh, hummingbird in flight to suggest the quick movement of the wings is just a, a gray blur. So the way the wings travel is from that shoulder joint, um, a big rounded triangle going back like this, and another big rounded triangle matching that going forward and not exactly opposite each other. They're slightly forming a very shallow V. And then inside those triangles do uh, radiating lines to suggest the big wing feathers. And that makes the uh, the blurred moving wings of a flying hummingbird. And the only solid part of those wings is the, the uh, flesh and bones part is a very short um, part right in here in the right around the, the joint right in the center at the shoulder. So you can color slightly darker a little triangle going forward and back right at the base of the wings. Um, now, coming from that um, uh, from that uh, shoulder where the wings attach, um, down not quite in the center of the body, a little closer to the back of the body, a line down towards the tail, but then curving forward to the belly. And those, those are the, uh, the flank feathers, which are uh, arranged in rows like this. And uh, uh, then on the back, the feathers on the back are also arranged in rows like this. Uh, and I'll fill in the, a little more darkness on the tail. Hummingbird's tail, ruby-throated hummingbirds have a long forked tail, but it folds up to a, a narrow point when they're hovering. And then the tail comes back here and not quite to the, not quite to the edge of those flank feathers and curves up just a little bit there. There's a kind of fluffy, uh, fluffy white patch here on the lower flanks. And hummingbirds feet when they're hovering are almost completely hidden. So right here at the corner at the, the lowest point at the, where the belly curves back towards the tail can just do a, a little front toes and back toes and the claws. And that's about all you see of a hummingbird's feet when they're hovering. Uh, I'll fix up the bill a little bit. Um, oops.
Um, but that's the, uh, the basics of a ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, and getting those shapes and the big patterns um, in place is the key. Then adding details, once you've gotten this far, adding the details um, of uh, other feathers, individual feathers, colors, more detail in different parts. Um, you can, uh, I mean, we could keep going on that for a long time, but um, this is the most important part is this um, getting these, the shape and proportions and the structure right. And once you have this, the colors and patterns um, really fall into place. Um, let me try. Uh, so I was talking about the hummingbird's wing. Um, I'm going to hide that one and go back to um, just to explain what a hummingbird's wing structure is like. So the hummingbird's wing is shaped like this. And here's the body. Um, the wing bones are like this, the upper arm, the forearm, and the hand. Those are the bones and their long feathers come out like this. Um, and so that's the, uh, the shape of a hummingbird's wing. It's very, uh, uh, it's like all birds, the wing is almost entirely feathers. Um, but most species, let me switch to uh, try a different color. Um, so another species, let's say a robin, might have a wing shape more like this. Uh, and the robin's wing bones would be longer, taking up a lot more of the wing and the big, uh, sorry, that's getting too complicated. Let me go back. I'll uh, make a new layer. So, um, hang on. We'll hide the robin and now make a new layer. Um, so, a robin's wing is shaped more like this. The wing bones like this. Um, and So, on a hummingbird's wing, oops, still figuring this out. So the robin's wing, like a, the bones extend more than halfway out. The, and uh, on a hummingbird's wing, the bones are just very close to the body, very short. And the feathers form almost the entire wing. So. Let me go back to the, uh, the hummingbird drawing. Um, the hummingbird's wing bones are here, just like this. 
that darker part that we drew, everything out here, all that is feathers. All of this is just feathers zipping back and forth 70 times per second. Um, so that's uh, uh, drawing a hummingbird's wings is very different from drawing the wings of uh, other birds um, just because their structure is so different. Um, let me check the questions again. Can you see the questions or would you like to? Uh, I see the questions now. Um, uh, so a ruby threaded hummingbird, the length of a ruby threaded hummingbird, I think is just about, um, uh, what are they? I, I don't actually know. I'm going to say three inches, but I don't know if that's, uh, if that's right. They're tiny. <laughs> um, and <clears throat> I see a question of what was the toughest bird to draw in the guide? I, um, you know, the, I had a, a problem, I had a challenge with herons and egrets. Um, I, I think herons and egrets, the, um, they're very graceful, elegant and graceful at a distance, but up close, they're really prehistoric. Um, very reptilian, that long, long curved neck is, it's bony and angular at close range, and that big bill. Um, and getting those two things balanced, this sort of elegance and dinosaur look of them um, was really a challenge and it's so they're also they're large birds so the drawings that I'm doing are quite small and that means that the the, the details have to be really precise um, because you're shrinking something big down to a small size so the the thickness of the neck the shape of the neck all those things um, have to be uh, really precise in those drawings. So I, I always had a problem, had a difficulty drawing herons and egrets um, and just being happy with the results. Um, let's see. So yeah, you're asking about um, how do hummingbirds handle the colder seasons? Well, most species, all, all the species in North America migrate south. Oops, lost my iPad, there we go. Um, they migrate south and um, uh, spend the winter in places where it doesn't freeze, where they can still find flowers and insects. So quite a few hummingbirds now in um, uh, in the last 50 years, more hummingbirds have started wintering along the Gulf Coast and in Florida, um, and even in Georgia. Quite a few hummingbirds now winter in Georgia, um, where hummingbird feeders and flower gardens um, provide uh, food for them, and probably the winters are a little bit warmer than they were uh, 50 years ago. Um, but they also have a, a um, special ability called torpor, where they, they essentially hibernate just overnight. Their body temperature drops to um, under 60 degrees, their metabolism slows down, their heart rate slows way down, and uh, so they use almost no energy overnight um, while they sleep. And then in the morning when the sun comes up, they, uh, they warm up um, by shivering. Their muscles start to shake, and produce heat, and they warm themselves up. They'll sit out in the sun to warm up and then start feeding again. Um, but they wouldn't be able to make it through a cold night. Um, their metabolism is so high that they wouldn't be able to make it through a cold night um, uh, being fully awake 
or at their normal rate they they have to feed um quite often to uh to have enough energy to keep going so the only way they can make it through a really cold night is to go into torpor um, and uh let's see um There's a, I see a question about the structure of the hummingbird's wing, more feather to bone area, give, does it give them more lift and flexibility in changing direction? Um, it gives, well, obviously it, it has evolved specifically for their style of flight, their hovering style. And let me, um, um, let me go back to this drawing. Um, I'll have, I'll put in, one more color. Um, so the when a hummingbird flaps, as it flaps, as its wings move forward, the wing um, kind of uh, tilts at an angle like this, so that it's pushing air down and and keeping them uh, keeping them up. Uh, and when the, that's on the, on the forward wing stroke, as the wing's coming forward, and as the, then the, the wing changes direction and goes back, and it's tilted like this. So again, it's pushing air down as it moves back. So the wing is is constantly um, it's tilted, and you do the same kind of thing like in a swimming pool. As if you try to essentially tread water with your hands in a swimming pool, you move your hands forward with your thumb pointing thumb at the leading edge, and then flip your hand over and move your hand back with the thumb at the leading edge again. The hummingbird's doing the same thing with its wings in the air, and that's how they can hover. Um, they get some lift from the forward stroke and the, the back stroke, and um, uh, their wing structure um, must help with that, um, that particular style of flight. No other bird flies that way. It's unique to hummingbirds. Um, but their, their wing structure with those very short bones and long feathers is shared almost exactly by swifts, which have a completely different flight style. Um, lots of uh, sailing and just holding their wings straight out to the side and, and uh, sailing along and flapping quickly, um, but lots of gliding. So swifts and hummingbirds both have very similar wing structure and completely different flight styles. Um, so and that's a good question. Why, how does the hummingbird's wing structure help it uh, with its hovering flight. Um, I don't know if anyone's looked at that specifically. Um, I see another question about the, yes, this is a side view of the hummingbird and the, so, so yes, we're seeing the, the right wing, the left wing would be behind the body, but following exactly the same path as the right wing. So, um, you would see, uh, in this view, you would see the left wing as it came out uh, to the left and right of the body. Um, and hummingbirds' lifespan, they, they have a very long lifespan, especially compared to um, mammals with the same metabolism. There's one record of a a broad-tailed hummingbird, which is a Rocky Mountain species in Colorado. Um, I think that broad-tailed hummingbird had been banded and, and tracked for years, and I, I think it got up to 12 years old, which is a record for hummingbirds and close to the record for, uh, it's, it's um, above the record of a lot of species of songbirds. So um, they have a pretty long lifespan. Um, most of them probably only live a few years, but but some, if they're lucky, they can uh, 
survive for 12 years and possibly more. Yeah, we had a uh, we have a member here in Atlanta, David, who you were mentioning the wintering hummingbirds yep. here in Georgia. We, you know, Rufus hummingbird is probably the most common wintering species that we get here in Georgia. And we had a member who had a female Rufus hummingbird coming to her feeder every winter for I want to say four or five straight years. Um, it was wow. banned. You know, I think in the first or second year that it showed up, and so they were able to to know that it was that same bird that came back every single oh, year yeah. for quite a while. So yeah. amazing. Wow, and that's amazing because that bird was probably migrating to spend its summer in British Columbia or even southern Alaska, um, and then wintering in Georgia, and <laughs> able to do that year that's after year. Later. That's incredible was recited, you know, on its breeding ground. So never knew exactly where it was going. Mm -hmm. it always came to the exact same feeder, right? You know, within a couple of weeks, it would yep. show up at the same time every year. Wow. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, oh, I see a question about the Third edition of the Sibley Guide to Birds. Yes, I'm always working on the next edition of the Sibley Guide to Birds. There are no plans for it yet at the moment, nothing definite, but I'm always working on it. And um, uh, you know, I could show you actually what I'm here on my iPad. So I have, uh, like this is a, uh, uh, mountain chickadee. Um, that's the. So here's the. Uh, um, this is the mountain chickadee illustration that is reproduced in the book, um, and that. Uh, you know these paintings were done. Well, they were done more than twenty years ago because this month is the twentieth anniversary of the publication of the field guide. Um, so these paintings were done more than 20 years ago and they were done um, uh, to be reproduced at a small size. So shrunk down uh, to a small size, they look, they look good. <laughs> now with digital media, when you zoom in, they're very rough. Um, and uh, they were not meant to be viewed or reproduced at that size. So with the iPad, I've been playing around with um, uh, adding more adding more detail, um, cleaning them up. So this is my my new new improved iPad version of the mountain chickadee painting. There's the old one and there's the new one. So I've been working on things like that um, and uh, thinking about a third edition of the guide. Um, so I don't know uh, when I'll have time <laughs> to do all this. These uh, take quite a bit of time, so I don't think I'll be uh, uh, um, redoing all of the images in the book um, uh, in the near future, but uh, I've been having fun um, working on those. Um, and what bird do I love to draw the most? I think the, um, well, I, I like, you know, all birds. <laughs> They're all fun to draw. They all have their own challenges. They're all unique. Um, and uh, uh, the wood warblers have always been one of my favorite groups. The um, the small songbirds that migrate um, back and forth from Central and South America up to the uh, to northern North America. Well, they're all over North America. So some species nest only in the south. Some migrate all the way to Alaska or Labrador. Um, and these wood warblers are just they're just so magical when they reappear in the spring and they're. They're on their way south now, they're just disappearing. So the last few here in Massachusetts, we're just seeing 
the last few individuals making their way south, um, which is always kind of bittersweet. It's really fun to see them, but also knowing that they won't be back until May. Um, so the wood warblers have always been one of my favorite groups and uh, really fun to draw. Um, and let's see what, um, uh, I'm trying to think of what, uh, I'm through on the other, the chat box, David, who, okay. So, um, at what age you started to draw and how, what would you say is the best way to, to understand bird anatomy? Um, in order to draw them more realistically? So a bit of a two-parter question there for you. Yeah, um, so I started, I started drawing, well, I, I always liked drawing and birds were my favorite subject even when I was five years old. And my father's an ornithologist, so that uh, <laughs> made for lots of opportunities, bird books around the house and bird, bird stuff, bird people talking about birds, interested in birds. So. Um, uh, I started very young and um, uh, um, so I think the best, uh, well the best way to learn how to draw birds is to draw birds, um, <laughs> just practice, but also just just watching birds and I'll, you know, that gives me an idea of what I can do for the last uh, last 10 minutes or so here I can um, uh, do another drawing and explain some of those, some of the, the details of bird, um, bird structure, because birds' feathers are not, they're not arranged randomly or uniformly across the bird. They, they, the feathers are arranged in a very organized way in groups and, and rows. Um, and I alluded to some of that with this hummingbird drawing. Um, so let me do another drawing and um, uh, um, and I'll explain some of those things and I'll draw, um, let me say I'll draw a black and white warbler because that's, we were just talking about warblers and uh, black and white warblers got a nice uh, complex, but um, uh, um, what's the word? Revealing pattern. So it will demonstrate a lot of what I'm talking about. So um, this will have to be fairly quick, but um, so uh, just like the hummingbird, I will start with an oval for the body and for this, Warbler, let me make him, uh, mm, well, pretty much horizontal like this. And then the head, um, a little bit above the center of that oval. And the tail, um, like so. Um, I think I want the head a little bit lower now that I see that. Uh, and the bill, black and white warbler has a fairly long curved bill for a warbler, just slightly curved. And then I'll, the same way I did for the hummingbird, just taper the forehead, a smooth line around the back of the head and back to the tail. And on the underside, tapering out uh, deepest at the chest and then back up to the tail. Um, and to place the eye, a line back from the center of the bill and the eye just above that line. So <clears throat> we've got the uh, the basic outline. Um, now on the head, 
this line coming back down the center of the bill is really important. That's the where the bill would open. And that line, the bill, when a bird opens its bill, it opens all the way back almost to the eye to make a little dot right there where the... So, and this line coming back from along the opening of the bill um, continues as a dividing line between different groups of feathers. So it makes kind of a an arc underneath the eye and then curves and then um, back to the back of the cheek. There's another dividing line right through the eye to the base of the bill and then from the middle of the eye going back to the back of the cheek. Another dividing line starts at the base of the bill and divides the essentially the side of the head from the top of the head the eyebrow from the crown. And then on the lower corner of the bill, the, the bottom edge of the bill, there's a line coming back from there that divides the throat from the side of the head or the side of the jaw. And those lines, they all radiate from the base of the bill in very consistent, every bird has these same lines, the same bill structure. Um, and those lines define a lot of the patterns on the color patterns that you see on birds. So on a black and white warbler, um, the crown, uh, the sides of the crown are black. The center of the crown is white. A lot of species have crown stripes like this. So dark down the sides of the crown and white down the center. Um, the line right through the eye is dark, like this. And, uh, and we'll, have, we'll make this a, um, uh, a spring plumage. Oh no, they're like that in the fall. We'll make it an adult male black and white warbler. They're similar in the fall. So, Underneath the eye, now the feathers, little tiny, tiny feathers around the eye, they're arranged in concentric rings around the eye. So the, when the color patterns follow the lines of feathers around the eye, you end up with these rings. Some species have a, a very narrow ring of contrastingly pale feathers right up next to the eye that we call that an eye ring. Um, but it's, it's following the arrangement of feathers around the eye. The feathers are arranged in rings right up close to the eye. On black and white warbler, there's a broad pale arc below the eye and the cheeks. Um, the rest of the cheeks and the, that arc below the eye, below the pale area below the eye is dark. And then this strip along the side of the lower jaw is all white and the throat is all black. So those lines that radiate from the base of the bill all um, explain all of the color pattern of a black and white warbler. Um, and then, let's see, I'm going to sketch in just the outline of the wings here. Um, and just like I, I um, mentioned with the hummingbird, the feathers are arranged in, in organized rows um, and uh, lines, and that's how we see patterns like streaks. On, on a bird like a sparrow, um, the pattern of streaks is formed because the, each feather has a single dark streak on it, and the feathers are arranged in, in lines. So around the back of the black and white warbler's neck are small feathers arranged in, in rows and all with small dark streaks on them. Coming out from the dark throat, the feathers get bigger and broader and have bigger, broader black streaks on them. And they sort of radiate out across the breast like this. And then even bigger, longer feathers with bigger, broader streaks continue down the flanks. 
and curve a little bit. And they form this pattern because that's the way the feathers are arranged. This is the, this is the pattern formed by the feathers that are wrapping around the bird. Um, similarly on the back, each feather has a dark streak and the feathers are arranged in, in lines. So the black and white warbler's back is streaked. On the wings, there are uh, the greater coverts and the median coverts like this. And on those, the, each feather, the feathers um, are arranged like this, um, all parallel to each other. Each feather has a white tip. So with each feather being dark with a white tip, you put all of them together and it creates a pattern of a white bar across the wing. The same here, the feathers are dark with white tips. Uh, and then these big wing feathers, the secondaries and the primaries are dark with pale edges. And the same on the tail. The feathers are dark, these long straight feathers, dark with pale edges. And we'll give him some feet. And there's a black and white warbler. And so that's, um, the question was what, <laughs> what's the best way to learn how to draw birds? I think focusing on these, the arrangement of feathers, the structure, the, the pattern of, that the feathers form, the groups of feathers on the bird, that will go a long way towards explaining all of the really diverse colors and patterns that you see on a bird, the underlying arrangement of feathers is very similar in every species and uh, goes a long way towards explaining all that variation. So really drawing birds is all about understanding feathers and, and knowing what the, how the feathers are arranged and what they're doing. Um. Well, this is fantastic, David. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. We got a bonus bird out of it too with the yeah. white warbler so we appreciate that um i have put my email address into the chat box for everyone it's michelle.hamner at georgiaaudubon.org and if you want to send your completed drawings uh to me we will put those drawings on our facebook page and i'll tag uh david's Facebook page as well, so he can check everything out. But I will, uh, I'll try to get all those pictures up on our Facebook page tomorrow so everyone can see everyone's work. And I just want to share my own drawing. I hope you can see it. I feel like it turned Very out nice. right. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> well, this was fantastic. So thank you everyone for joining us. And I hope that we got to everyone's questions. I think we pretty much covered everything we saw. And this was really fun. I hope we can do it again, David. Maybe sometime in the spring or sometime next year, we can come back for round two. Yeah, that would be great. Great. Well, we will uh, get this recording out to everyone within the next few days. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone in another webinar or on one of our in-person field trips. So again, thank you so much to David, and we appreciate everything that you do for the bird community. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Take care, everyone. Good night.